no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Thanks for listening, and please don't forget to like and subscribe. We appreciate you. Starship number 25 and booster number 9 have been going through testing, preparing for another try at a transorbital flight. The first flight was amazing in a lot of ways, not the least because it completely destroyed the launch pad, blasting very large chunks of concrete into the air and out into the ocean. We discussed this at length in this lesson. Getting a few things wrong, of course. We must always leave a few snacks for the trolls from time to time. But also in this lesson, I estimated that in about 120 days, the launch pad would be repaired and ready to go again, with some type of flame control system. This proved to be essentially correct. Now we have this beautiful water deluge system, designed to spray high-pressure water in such a manner as to help disperse the exhaust blast. As you can see, this proved to be very effective during testing, and the pad survived all 33 engines firing at 50% power. Now everything seems to be ready to go for launch number two. The problem is the Federal Aviation Administration, and it looks like approval there might come through soon. Why did it take so long? The FAA are responsible for the safety of every plane or rocket that flies, including this one. And while I have been a big fan of SpaceX progress, I am not a big fan of their carelessness. A rush to launch a substandard rocket system when more advanced versions were available, with no pad protection at all, possibly to meet a childish deadline, probably made the FAA regret their prior approval. If something had gone wrong with the launch, and Starship had exploded on the launch stand, it would have been one of the most massive non-nuclear explosions in history. Now, if you've seen this lesson, you will have seen us compare the failures of the Soviet N-1 moon rocket with the devastating effects that a similar catastrophe would have at Starbase. The difference is that while Baikonur is very truly in the middle of nowhere, Starbase is within sight of inhabited areas. On this first attempt, three engines failed at launch and another three failed in flight, and the ship quickly lost all vector control. The rocket was able to compensate with differential thrust until it was at a high altitude, at which point it spun out of control, and the flight termination system was activated, which also failed to immediately destroy the rocket. If this had all happened at a lower altitude, and the rocket had gone far off course, this delay could have allowed the rocket to impact an inhabited area. Any one of these things is completely unacceptable. Destroying your launch pad because you think you're the first massive rocket in history that didn't need a deluge system. Having multiple engines fail on startup and more quickly fail in flight. And failing to design an adequate FTS. As each of them alone could result in a catastrophic loss of life. The fact that things went as well as they did with all of these failures is partially due to a robust design. But mostly to blind luck or divine providence. To understand what could have happened, let's watch what goes wrong when a rocket launches with asymmetric thrust. We all celebrated when a Long March 3B carried the Chang'e lander to the moon in 2013, making China the third nation in history to soft land on the lunar surface. But while we celebrate success, we must also study and plan for the possibility of failure. China has a long history of ignoring common sense safety protocols, launching frequently overpopulated areas, even allowing a falling first stage booster to impact near a school, releasing this toxic cloud of hypergolic fuel, which would be instantly deadly to anyone who breathed it. But this isn't the worst thing that's ever happened. It is 1996 and this is also a Long March 3B rocket. It happens to be carrying an American satellite, and there are Americans on site. 
The design of the 3B has four hypergolic fueled boosters and a hypergolic first and second stage. The third stage is hydrogen fueled with an optional hypergolic fourth stage. These side boosters provide a lot of thrust at launch, just like the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle. And when one doesn't fire properly, or you have a complete guidance failure, like this Russian rocket that had the system installed upside down, things go very bad. If we have a tremendous asymmetrical thrust, like multiple engine failures on one side, it can cause the rocket to veer dramatically off course, as you see here. The rocket flies horizontally for quite a while, and then impacts the ground in a massive explosion. China initially said that no one was harmed in the accident, but it turns out that there were alternative points of view. And here it clearly looks like the rocket impacted in an inhabited area. Americans working on the satellite that was launching drove down to the affected area the next day. As they were arriving, they noticed lots of trucks coming from the area, with tarps covering whatever they were carrying on the flatbeds. The Americans found this destroyed village which they were told had housed over a thousand people. The Chinese government first insisted that this village had never been there at all, finally admitting that maybe a few people died, but no more than 11. It's impossible to know how many lives were truly lost, but from these images, I would estimate it to be in the hundreds. While there is no success without risk, it must be calculated and rational risk not blind hubris and stupidity. I sincerely hope that SpaceX, with its famously immature leader, will take the next flight seriously. We were all counting on them, because if they fail, the next flag carried by humans to the moon will be this one. Something to think about. Thanks for listening, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.